may, maybe we should sort of may move into like uh, take this as a starting point for a theme or like mm -hmm. a, like a, a, if I can set it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to explore w how you see the uh, s um, the AI landscape today. Like what is the AI landscape? And now I'm highlighting we have industry, we, you are part of, of the industry to some degree. We, we have the public sector, private sector, we have regulations and people. And then we have on a macro level, uh, different superpowers. We have countries, but even, is it countries or is it super mega companies in these countries? Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe start, maybe, how would you see the AI landscape? If, if that's my broad mm -hmm. question, and you can sort of zoom in, and you can start on the on the tangent. You were starting on one tangent. What's the AI landscape about? Yeah, but <clears throat> I can I can zoom out a bit and sort of focus in uh, uh, on, on that uh, later. But if you look at the the sort of breakthroughs, why we are talking, why we, why we are here today, mm -hmm. why we have this show is because of a number of academic breakthroughs that happened around 2012 mm. uh, that made these type of algorithms be able to perform things that were impossible before. Mm. And this, this came from academia. Mm. Uh, and uh, this was relatively quickly followed with uh, uh, sort of the big tech companies, in particular Google was very, very early. Very early to understand, understand the value, the, yeah. understand the potential yes. and just running with it. Exactly. So they, they started buying up uh, departments. Uh, they were buying <laughs> up buying. university departments. Yes, but essentially. <laughs> And you say in 2012, you basically mean the AlexNet and computer vision and image yes, classification exactly. and that type of things. Yes. So, so that was the and and basically, uh, in, in in some ways, uh, it, it's in in one way it was overstated. In one way, it was understated. It was over uh, um, stated in the way that uh, in practice, if you look at what happened in 2012, it was images. Mm basically anything that or anything that could be expressed as an image computer now, vision is computer, yes computer vision is really what we're talking about exactly here. now there are i mean there are millions and millions of use cases for that so i, I don't want to say that uh, it's it's not important but it's sort of at that point where people started to attach the ideas of oh, uh, general artificial intelligence and sort of all, all of that talk became popular so they ended up at google most of the academia or the great people at uh, academia uh, and uh, lots of the pre PhD students. Uh, and those companies are American. Mm. And uh, what we, and there, there are some universities that managed to recover and there are some uh, universities that are really great today uh, at AI. But for the most, most part, and including Sweden, this was a relatively hard hit. We had very talented people working in academia in Sweden who left for Silicon Valley uh, for better pay, for opportunity to work with the best methods, best computers and so on. So a brain drain from countries and academia into yes. so tech giants. So in 2012, a true brain drain. Yeah, I think it was probably around 2014, 15 that's, yeah. that started. So it, it took a while to, to get, get started. And then um, mm. China, uh, sort of came in and uh, filled a void in the academic space, I would say, in um, around uh, 16, 17, sort of th there they, they start to become dominant with massive, massive funding of their, their universities. And uh, it became scary uh, sometimes when you saw like, who's the best at the, this type of algorithms? And you would say, the People Liberations Army <laughs> <laughs> Secret Security Division 5 in Beijing. Mm. Like, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, and when it comes to industry, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very, it looks very, very different in different fields. And we also have the confusing fact that as AI was gaining popularity, AI was becoming a much more inclusive term. So hyped uh, term, hyped so term, slapped on everything that moves. Yes, uh, or at least there was there was less and less of differentiation between that this was actually deep learning that mm. was driving this to generalizing to any type of AI. And then uh, in that was included traditional machine learning. And then it was uh, basic statistics. And then it was 
So well, well, if I write an if. So now, now a so small sidetrack, but as part of the mm. context of the AI landscape, uh, what is your definition then of AI? The, 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 the one second, two second, five second, mm. is it deep learning we're talking about as the true? So there's a difference between the sort of uh, what I think is the definition of it and wh- uh, the way I use it. Yeah. So my definition of it would be a software that uh, performs some uh, action that requires intelligence. Yeah. That that would be sort of the or software technology that. Uh, uh, my own definition when I use AI, uh, I am a bit chauvinistic, so I'm 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 in deep learning. If I'm talking about uh, other machine learning, I typically call it traditional machine learning. Uh, um, but, no, but, but because I think it's very interesting now, and here we sit with with super experts, and 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 I think it's a very fair, valid question to have also to calibrate mm-hmm. the conversation. And I think it's fair that you know within this context here now it, when I ask we talk about the AI landscape we're talking about the brain drain it has a lot to do with the deep learning context. Yes, yes. So uh, mm-hmm. and now when it comes to industry, so this the the AI uh, call it the AI revolution or the deep learning revolution it coincides with the digital transformation of industry, mm. and those two are very often intermingled. And there is a nat- natural relationship, but with the sort of co-option of the AI thing, I think there's one thing that's, that becomes a bit opaque, and that, that, that is that there are actually very few companies that have deep learning systems in production. Mm-hmm. You'll find the big tech giants and then some sort of uh, the, the super unicorns like Spotify or uh, Uber or things like that, so, sort of the... But, and I think this is a profound truth to talk about quite a bit because this opaqueness or this misrepresentation or mm. is also in some ways hindering us for looking cleanly at what deep learning is all about yeah. and how we can use that as a new coding paradigm. As you like to say, you don't need all the fancy big data stuff. You only need deep learning on the right data. Mm. I mean, like, so it's, and, and we, we have talked about this before. Mm. It's like, uh, oh, you know, we get misled by the analytical ladder, right? You need yeah. to do this before you do that. No, you don't. No. So uh, let's explore this even more now, because um, I think this is really interesting for everybody to how you see this point and how it really. I, because I think that's an important question, but, but just to close the discussion on the landscape. AI landscape. Yes, before. <laughs> Sorry. So we have the, the big tech giants in, in US and Perfect. China and. Um, what would you say the situation is in Europe and Sweden if you try to compare the like, yes. AI readiness so, levels? So so if you look at the past um, two or three years, uh, companies in the US, and I'm specifically talking about more of the sort of California and New York region, I, yeah. I'm not sure about uh, the average company. The, the average company, but the, the sort of knowledge and the adoption of technology is far higher than in Europe. Mm. Uh, so we are lagging behind and it's, it's not good. So the big tech companies are, are really accelerating yes, fast. Yes, they, they are. And there is an openness to uh, to using this technology uh, mm. that we haven't seen uh, in Europe, be it either because of the organization styles or... So mm. let's park that question also, mm. because now we have landscape and now we have two major themes to come up mm. around the corner here. <laughs> Why we have yeah, problems? W- yeah, what's the problem? The struggle uh, for companies to get started with uh, deep, and that's another you know very important topic. But let's I think. take. I think it's any yeah. and 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 an other angles on this landscape, or mm. is that sort of you know? I think that's a good macro summary right here. So mm. uh, yeah, so I would say uh, right now uh, where where we are, you have a predominant uh, U.S. domination in uh, uh, the technology, and especially when it comes to algorithms uh, and. Uh, practical sort of applications of them or uh, that. And then you have a lot of strong research coming from China. So these are the sort of two big theoretical uh, uh, bases. Uh, The space that hasn't been occupied yet and uh, that uh, we believe that Europe has a great chance is in the tooling space. Because ultimately, no matter how cool these algorithms are, unless they really get into the hands of people and more people beyond just the tech giants, uh, they're not going to be th- that useful. So I think we we uh, we we do have an opportunity. We haven't like it's not a done deal that Europe will be a zero in AI and uh, everything will be dominated by uh, the US and China. Mm-hmm. Just look at the steam engine, for instance, British invention. Uh, what really changed the world there was 
not the invention. It was a necessary condition, but it wasn't a sufficient one. And what really sort of made a steam engine ubiquitous was the machine tooling for building a steam engine. Mm. When it became very cheap to build a steam engine, then it exploded. And the Americans were really good at this, even though it was a sort of British invention and uh, uh, you, uh, England dominated the sort of steam steam race. Mm. So when, when the actual tooling around building steam engines became easy to use, I guess? or Cheaper. Yeah, cheaper, widely available. When there, yeah. when there was machine tooling, so that it yeah. wasn't... Each steam engine wasn't uh, meticulously handcrafted by a few experts. Mm -hmm. So then it really revolutionized the world and the steam engine you know, mm -hmm. started the, the industrial revolution in different ways, exactly. I guess. Yeah, it was all about automating physical power. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think it's an apt analogy to AI where we are looking to automate things that require intelligence. So it's, uh, th there is a nice analogy there. And also now that we are in a situation where most AI systems are, are handcrafted by experts. Mm. But, but let's just before we wrap up the sort of landscape topic, uh, one angle that I think is also quite in interesting to explore where you think it is, is it's also a little bit about where the uh, main trends go, like wh wh what path are we on now? So, so clearly we're on a path of, you know, that we have been on for some while to use, uh, g you know, smarter ways of processors with, with GPUs, right? And we, now we see next steps, GPU processing, even going out, all the way into visualization tools. So this is one key trend. And then we have the whole you know, GPT-3, <laughs> in general, you know, those kind of, you know, uh, transformers uh, trend. Then, of course, there must be a fundamental trend that I think has, well, if I take the more generalist view on this, not only deep learning, but I think it goes into uh, anywhere is the funda fundamental trend of simplification, you know, so to, um, uh, to, to quote uh, fr from a Gartner conference a couple of years ago, you know, when do we go from scarcity to abundance, like a, a real tipping point? I think this is a major trend. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have an abundance of data, but we have scarcity of uh, value into, you know, tree production value. And, and what is sort of driving from scarcity to abundance? Well, it's, it's when it becomes simple enough for everyone to use it. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the great example is internet, of course. So it's mm -hmm. been around for 20, 30 years, but we all recognize it from the mid nineties. And what made it abundant was the web browser, yeah? So I think this scarcity, to, so that's, I think it's a major trend to go after. Would you agree with those kind of core trends? Or am, am I, some more? Uh, yeah, absolutely. 